welcome all of you to our worship service here at Bethany today. Welcome to those who are joining us online as well. We are continuing with that series entitled Crushed. In fact, this is our final week for that series. Today we'll see how human rejection is crushed by divine exaltation. We know that as we follow Jesus in this world, we're going to face the same sort of rejection that he faced. And yet we find hope for our own exaltation from God in the exaltation and glorification of our Savior, our leader, Jesus. So God's blessings as you consider that with me today. If you would, please find the green guest card located at either end of your pew. Please give us a record of your visit with us here today, or you can use the QR code on the back of your service folder or on that card with your smartphone and give us a record of your visit that way. Uh, Then take just a moment to greet those worshiping nearby you. We will join together then in our opening hymn. seated as we begin today. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. We talked at the beginning that our hope for divine exaltation is wrapped up entirely in Jesus. It stands to reason then that Jesus needs to be the most important thing in our lives, the thing that we value above all else. And so Paul takes on that subject in this section when he points to other things that people try to hold on to to find value or worth in God's sight or to find hope for divine exaltation, things revolving around who we are or what we do. But Paul says all of that's rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. So please listen. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. 
I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings. Becoming like Him in His death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already achieved, arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of our God. Invite our children here today to come forward for their message. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. We're going to look at a Bible passage that we're going to read in our gospel reading in just a couple of minutes, but I'm going to put it up here on the screen. It says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Okay? This is going to kind of be the theme of our whole service today. The stone the builders rejected. Do you know who that stone is? It's Jesus, okay? Do you know who the builders are? Okay, it could be us. It was especially the religious leaders in Jesus' day. God sent Jesus as the stone. He was the one that the church was going to be built on. He was the Savior, right? The most important thing there was. But the builders, the religious leaders, when they saw Jesus, they rejected him. They didn't think he was very special or important. He didn't seem to be doing the sorts of things that they wanted him to do. He didn't seem to think they were as important as they thought they were. And so they rejected him. They put him on trial and made sure that he went to the cross. But God says that stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Even though some people had this low opinion of Jesus God had a very high opinion of Jesus. He was going to make him our Savior, and he did. Three days after he died, he rose from the dead, right? And Jesus became the cornerstone on which the church is built. And I want to show you a picture here. A picture that shows Jesus as the cornerstone. It means that he's the most important thing in the church. All of God's people are connected to him. All of God's people line up their lives with him. Jesus is the most important thing, not only in the church, but in the world and in our own lives, right? And so the lesson we want to learn today is that we don't make the same mistake that those builders made. To think that Jesus isn't so special or important, or maybe think that to hear his word or to come to church is not very special or important. God has made sure that we know that Jesus is the most valuable one that we have, the most important one in our life. And God has shown us that hearing his word and coming to worship him here at church helps to keep us connected to Jesus, who is our cornerstone. And so we want to make sure that nothing ever becomes more important to us than that. So let's fold our hands and we'll ask God to help us with that, okay? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for sending Jesus as our Savior. Though he was rejected by many, you exalted him and made him the cornerstone of the church. Help us to never reject him in our hearts or in our lives, but to always see him as the most valuable one that we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for listening, guys. You can return to your seats. Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke chapter 20. It's a story that Jesus told to share with the people the sort of 
rejection that he was going to face so that they wouldn't be surprised by it when it happened. He wanted them to know what was going to happen so that they wouldn't stumble over him in all of this and end up rejecting him along with many others. He wanted them to see that though he would be rejected, he was still going to be that cornerstone on which God would build his church. Since this is the gospel of our Lord, I invite you to please stand for our reading. Jesus went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit from the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately, because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. This is the gospel of our Lord. We'll continue by making confession of our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll join in our next hymn.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. The part of God's Word that we'll look at this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 43. He shows, <coughs> excuse me, in this section how God's rescue and exaltation of His people in the past give us hope for the same things in the future. So please listen. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. This is what the Lord says. Nothing matters more than that, right? Nothing is more important than God's words and His promises. At least nothing should be. No one's opinion is more important than His or to be valued more highly than His. But that's not always how things are. So often the opinion of family and friends, the opinion of <clears throat> the so-called experts or intellectuals in our world, the opinion of the masses or the majority in our world seems to be more compelling, more trustworthy. But the thing is, they often get it wrong. People's opinions don't always mesh with the truth. Think about the story of Joseph. His brothers viewed him as a spoiled brat, a dreamer with these visions of grandeur. They viewed him as somebody to be gotten rid of. And so they threw him in a pit and sold him as a slave. But God had a different opinion of Joseph. God had plans for Joseph, and those plans were going to be carried out. You might remember the reaction of Joseph's brothers many years later when, as second in command of all Egypt, Joseph revealed himself to them. What did they think of his brother at that point? Or remember the friends who came to comfort Job during his great suffering. Their opinion of him didn't mesh with the truth. They accused him basically of concealing some great sin and failing to confess it. That's why all of this was happening to him. But God had a different opinion of Job. He had already made clear that Job was blameless, upright, someone who feared God. And so when God brought Job's ordeal to an end, we're told that he blessed Job even more greatly than he had at the beginning. What did Job's friends think of him then? The religious leaders in Jesus' day and so many others had an opinion of Jesus that didn't mesh with God's. And they made their feelings very clear. Nevertheless, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus himself said, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. The world in general has a view of Christ's church that doesn't mesh with the truth. So often the world views the church as weak and worthless, splintered and oppressed. But the day is coming when the church, the people of God, will be brought to glory at His side. 
See, it's God's opinion that matters most. Nothing is more important than His words and promises. What He plans will be carried out. For God's people in this world, human rejection is going to be a fact of life. It always has been and always will be. But this rejection will be crushed by divine exaltation when all of God's promises to His people are fulfilled. This is what the Lord says. People of Israel were well acquainted with human rejection. After God provided for the rescue of Egypt and so many others through Joseph, Joseph and his family were welcomed by the Egyptians to live among them. They were given a prime place in the land of Egypt to call home. But after many years, that spirit of gratitude and welcome was replaced by one of hostility and rejection. The Egyptians began to resent the Israelites. And so they enslaved them. They worked them mercilessly. They tried to make sure that they could never revolt against them by carrying out this systematic murder of all of the male Israelite babies. The people of Egypt viewed the Israelites as worthless. And you can imagine what that did to the people's image of themselves and their image of their God. I mean, God had made promises to them. Promises that had been passed down from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and to the generations that followed. And yet, here they were, enslaved, watching their babies die, completely rejected by the people in whose land they were living and powerless to do anything about it. But God's opinion of them hadn't changed. His love for them hadn't changed. His plans for them and His promises to them hadn't changed. And so when the time was right, divine exaltation would crush this human rejection. God sent one plague after another, ten in all, to break the spirit of those who were oppressing His people. God raised up a leader, a strong leader, around which His people could rally in Moses. And suddenly the Egyptians could see just how much God cared about His people. Just what God would do to rescue His people. With that awesome pillar of cloud and fire, God led His people into the wilderness. And then with that same pillar, He shielded them along the shores of the Red Sea from the approaching Egyptian army. Then as God reminded His people through Isaiah, He made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, so that His people could escape to safety. But then with those same mighty waters, God dealt one last crushing blow to the Egyptians. As His people stood on the far shore of the Red Sea and watched as pieces of chariots and the bodies of horses and horsemen washed up on shore, they knew what God had done. Divine exaltation had crushed human rejection. But now Isaiah says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. God had plans to act on behalf of His people once again. And these plans would pave the way for an even greater deliverance and even greater exaltation than what His people had experienced on the shores of the Red Sea. As Isaiah wrote these words, it wasn't too long in the future that God's people would once again find themselves as captives in a foreign land. The powerful and prideful Babylonians would overrun the southern kingdom of Judah they would destroy its cities, including the city of Jerusalem. They would plunder the temple of its holy things and destroy that place as well, and then carry so many of God's people off into captivity. 
these Babylonians thought themselves the masters of the world at that time. And they viewed God's people as of no account and their God as powerless to protect them. And again, you can imagine the impact that that had on the hearts and minds of God's people. But they knew, or at least they had been told, why it had all happened. It was because of their sin. Because they had preferred idols over the true God. They'd forgotten God in His promises. And so now they were suffering under this human rejection, the hands of the Babylonians. But God had not forgotten them. His love for them, despite their sins, would continue. And His plans for them and His plans through them would be carried out. And so once again, divine exaltation would come to the rescue. In one night, that mighty Babylonian empire was replaced by a new one. The empire of the Medes and the Persians. And God had predicted it. A new king from this new empire had already been selected and even named by God as the instrument that he would use to return his people to the promised land. King Cyrus issued a decree that whoever wanted to return to Israel could. He authorized the rebuilding of the temple and the city that housed it. He even provided resources from his own treasury. He returned all of the items from the temple that had been plundered so many years before. You can imagine what his royal advisors were thinking. Why would the king be doing this for this people? You wonder what other conquered peoples in the Persian Empire were thinking when they saw this one nation exalted in this way. God basically paved a path through the dry, desolate Arabian wilderness with the wealth and the power of the Persians so that his own people could return to their homeland. Divine exaltation crushed human rejection. See, it's God's opinion. His word, his promises, his plans that matter most. They will be carried out. In our Gospel reading today, we saw another very vivid example of that truth. We talked about it with the children. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Nowhere do we see human rejection crushed by divine exaltation more clearly than in Jesus. His own brothers thought he was out of his mind. The crowds that flocked around him to hear him teach and watch the miracles, they quickly turned away when they didn't seem to be getting what they wanted. The religious leaders, the ones who were supposed to be the builders of God's church, they accused Jesus of blasphemy and even being in league with Satan. Their rejection of him was so fierce and so fervent that they ignored the miracles that took place right before their eyes. They disregarded the law of God as they conducted themselves in this matter. They even secured bold-faced liars to help drive Jesus to the cross. Talk about rejection. But we know why it happened. It was part of God's plan for our salvation. The human rejection that Jesus faced would take him to the place where he would make payment for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. This stone that so many rejected, the stone that was even abandoned and forsaken by God himself, would be picked up again by God and set in place as the cornerstone on which his eternal kingdom was built. Three days after the shouts to crucify him. Three days after the beatings and the mockings. Three days after Jesus was rejected and despised by men as he hung there on the cross and even abandoned and forsaken by his Father. That great exaltation would begin. 
The Apostle Paul says that Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Early Easter morning, Jesus took up his life again, descended into hell to proclaim his victory over Satan. Then he showed himself alive to people here on earth, even to some who doubted him. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven, took his place at the right hand of God, and from there he rules over absolutely everything for the benefit of his church, for the benefit of his people, just as he said. From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the mighty God. In Jesus, human rejection was crushed by divine exaltation. And by it, our eternal salvation was secured. This is the new thing that God wanted His people in Isaiah's day to know was going to happen. This is the former thing from our perspective that God wants to make sure that we never forget. Because in this we find our eternal security. In this we find our only hope of salvation and divine exaltation. And so we must value Christ in the same way that God does. We must see Him as our only hope. See, despite all that God had done in pure grace for the people of Israel over the years, there were still so many of them that took this attitude that they could expect divine exaltation from God based on who they were or what they had done or on the things that they were doing. Paul addressed that attitude in our lesson from the Philippians today. He made it clear that he of all people had reason to boast in his heritage as a Jew, in his strict obedience to God's law. But he made it clear that all of that was worthless compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. Still today, there are so many who seek to find their value and exaltation from God based in who they are and what they do. That temptation is there for us as well. To think about our own lives as God's people, our faithfulness to Him, our obedience to His Word. But again, only in Christ do we find our hope for exaltation. It was always for Jesus' sake alone that God came to rescue and exalt His people. Why did He deliver them from that slavery in Egypt? Because these were the people from whom Jesus would come. Why did He bring them from Babylon back to the Promised Land? Because that was the place where Jesus was to be born. And so in the same way, we have to see Jesus as our only hope for divine exaltation and nothing else at all. That's why Paul says, I consider everything rubbish, garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. That's the attitude. That's the spirit we have to have as we make our way through life in this world. It means that we're not going to value the same things that the world values. It means that we're never going to look to ourselves or who we are, our pedigree, or the things that we do for God to try and find confidence before Him. But only and always to our humble Savior and everything that He did for us will value those things that connect us to Him. His Word and sacraments will follow the path that He lays out for us in life even though it's going to be drastically different from the path that the world would have us walk. We'll remain always willing to endure the hardship, the suffering, the ridicule, or whatever else may come from our connection with Jesus. If that stone faced so much rejection during His days here on earth, and we know that people who are built on Him, you and I, we're going to face that rejection as well. But never forget that God's opinion is the one that matters most. We know His promise. We know what He thinks about us thanks to Jesus. He calls you and I 
His chosen ones. The people that He formed for Himself that we may proclaim His praise. And so we will, both now and forever. God will deliver us from human rejection with a divine exaltation that's far greater than what His people experienced on the shores of the Red Sea. One that's far greater than what they experienced on that joyful procession back to the promised land. The Lord Jesus. The one in whom our lives are now hidden. He will return in glory. And on that day, His church, the people of God who were purchased with His own blood, will be revealed, glorified, and brought to His side in the view of all. This stone that so many rejected will be clearly held up as the cornerstone and the capstone. And His people, those that He created to bring Him praise, they will be joined at His side in glory forever. Divine exaltation will crush human rejection. This is what the Lord says. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to please stand. We'll join in the song of response. continue with our prayers, I invite you to join your hearts with mine. Dear Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for the divine exaltation that you have granted to us through the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son. Dear Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace once again this morning on behalf of Don and Nancy Krause's granddaughter, Heather, who continues to have complications in her pregnancy. We thank you for some promising signs, but we ask that you continue to grant her healing, health, and strength. Keep mother and baby safe until the time of delivery. Dear Father, we pray also for our sister, Heather Dearson, who will undergo heart surgery this Friday down in Milwaukee. We ask that you would be with the doctors and all who assist. Give them success in their work. And grant Heather a quick and full recovery. And in the meantime, Lord, Keep Heather's heart at peace. Reassure her that you are with her and in control of all things. Dear Father, we pray also for Rob Sudemeyer, the father of our member Dwayne, whose cancer has returned and now seemed to have spread. We ask that you would be with him during this difficult days. According to your gracious will, if there is a path to treatment, show that to the doctors who are caring for him. But especially be with Rob. Reassure him of your love and your perfect plans for your people. Finally, Lord, we come before you on behalf of Brian Reinhardt, who ex experienced a, perhaps a mild heart attack this week and is now hospitalized. We ask that you would be with his doctors as they plan his course of treatment and bless their efforts as well. Restore Brian to health and again, keep him confident of your love and care in his life. We ask all this in Jesus' name. We join together in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
We will continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that You have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it You will strengthen our faith in You and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll join together in our closing hymn.